Preservation of the places and things that make our communities strong is important to continuing a rural way of life. Coming up next on the best of RFD Maine, we'll take a look at our state's rural heritage and the need to understand its significance as we move into the future. I'm going. Come on. We'll meet those who farm both land and sea and hear firsthand how people are adapting their livelihoods in new ways. People from the county to the coast share their hopes for what the future will bring. Stay with us. Production of RFD Maine is made possible through a television demonstration grant from Rural Development, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Giving back more than we take from the Maine coast has never been more important than it is today. The islands, remember, are just kind of the tips of an iceberg, and, and it's, you know, it's all of that productivity that is, on, that is underneath the waters that uh, is influenced by what happens on those islands. And there's, you know, islanders, in my experience, have a tr tremendous conservation ethic. I mean, it's just ingrained in the lifestyle, the way of life. It's never too late to strengthen the kinds of relationships that allow our communities and natural resources to remain in balance and thrive. Hi, I'm Sandy Fippen, your host for the best of RFD Maine. You know, there's a quote from the landscape painter John Muir. He said something like, uh, when you start to look at something by itself, you find out that it's linked to everything else in the universe, and how true that is. We're all linked together, past, present, and future. In this next piece, we go to Aroostook County, where many people say they can still see the rural Maine the way it used to be, and meet, among other people, Leonard Johnson and Kathy Olmsted, especially, who are two of the forces behind Echoes Magazine, a northern journal which preserves the past of Aroostook County, but is also concerned about its future. Let's take a look. I think television's wonderful. I sit in my recliner and stare at it for long hours, I assure you. If television, and you know, with all due respect, <laughs> if it replaces our storytelling traditions, then how does a young person know where he or she is coming from? The children used to play more outdoors. You'd go by in the yard, there was always the children out in the yard playing. Today, they're sitting in the front room, in front of the TV. <laughs> if that's all kids have, you know, if that's their total culture, um, they've, they've missed a base. Having a magazine like Echoes helps to get um, stories out to people not just in this community, but all over the country. We feel we're trying to capture some of the things that have been lost in many other places before they're lost here, because there are qualities of community that are at risk. What we're seeking is, is the people who remember life before television, before shopping malls, when they, they, they know how to provide for themselves. What is one of the most common questions that you're asked when you go somewhere? Um, where did you come from? We want to, to, um, to remember the things that give us a foundation. It gives us a strong place to put our feet down. I spent most of my life with high school age people uh, as a teacher and drama coach and all. And, and I, through the years, would feel sad to hear them say, oh, I can't wait to get out of here and get where there are exciting people and real things are happening and it's good that they go somewhere else and see some of the world. I applaud that but uh, uh, I think Echoes helps them to have pride. I think that there's a wonderful 
thing that happens when people come from outside to see what we're doing. I think that it energizes us. I think that it gives us some incentive in some ways to, to keep on figuring out who we are so that we can share that with other people who are coming from away. The qualities of community that people talk about when they come here or when they write to the magazine are the friendliness of the people, people who know you by name, going into town and not having to lock your car when you go to the grocery store. And I'm hoping that, that Echoes can tell that story, is to help recognize that uh, it's not just about the past, but it's about what we can do right now to, uh, to, be, to meet the future. Sometimes meeting the future requires a lot of creativity, as you will see in this next piece on the Bell family and their farm on Cobbs Cook Bay. My son, Brian, Bob's two sons, and my daughter, they're the eighth generation here. The first Bell arrived here in 1765, and um, he saw the potential for a grist mill, and that's what he basically wanted to do. But in talking to the, a Native American in Eastport, they directed him to the site. We're looking at the original mill site. Uh, the, uh, some of the cribbing is where the mill sat. Beyond is cribbing where a schooner would dock. And we heard that the gates would open automatically as the tide turned. And then when it turned to go out, they would bang shut. And when the head got great enough, that's when the grinding of the flour would start. He came here from Scotland at the age of 14 and married a school teacher in Lubeck and I guess it was Eastport, and uh, they settled on a piece of property across the bridge over on this little hill after they determined their gristmill site. I know we have a letter from his uh, brother who was asking if there was an opportunity in New England at that time because his family had been barbers and uh, the king had taxed powder that was used in the wigs and the hair of the people and it was put in under duress at that time and uh, so I don't know his age but he was younger than uh, Robert. It seems like there's been plenty of opportunities for uh, the land to have gotten sold, people moved off the property but there always seems to be some reason that a bell has stayed here and lived and and kept the namesake to the property. I love farming uh, and it's great to just see that aspect of, that's kind of slipping away from the area of Maine and it's getting real hard to uh, make a living this way so I'd like to find something that I can have more of the farm as a hobby and something else that's more my like money earner. I find that for me to stay here you've got to love the land and uh, my wife calls the farm my mistress so she uh, she can be jealous at times, but it's first the love of the land, and then it's surviving with your wits and being an opportunist to dictate what you do to stay here. And that goes in a faster cycle, it seems like, every generation. And we've already have done, I could probably list five different occupations already to try to stay here. Going. Come on. Uh, going. First it was uh, sheep, we had 100 head of sheep, and then we went into dairy cows and went to 120 head of dairy cows. Uh, in 78 those were sold, we went into managing the woods more intensively, so we became woodcutters, and uh, from then we, we uh, started an outside job of uh, providing chips to a local biomass plant. And a big thing we have now is a farmhouse that we have weekly rents to that house and it's from people that, that want a, a setting of a farm life with, uh, with a vacation besides. I come here and it's just so quiet and, and peaceful and get to work on the farm equipment and everything and it was, it was really fun. I hope that Brian and, and Jesse and Aaron and Rachel understand how lucky they are to be able to grow up here. Uh, coming from a metropolitan area, I'm a school teacher. Uh, I know what the kids have to fight against every day. 
and they're just really lucky to be able to, this is a refuge. A whole family seems so committed to one another and then to holding this piece of property and history together. I never really thought of it much as keeping it in the Bell name, but mm -hmm. it's more just because I, I love the place that is more my reason for definitely sticking around and keeping it. You know, it's not just the main landowners who have to think creatively about the future. It's also the fishermen along the main coast. When I was growing up, you could sit on a dock and catch a lot of flounder, even without bait. And we'd have tubfuls of lobsters and clams cooking up on the stove for a Sunday picnic. But that's not true anymore. A few years ago, those of us who live around the Frenchman's Bay area happened to notice this strange glow at night from the ocean and we went out in boats to find out what it was all about and it turned out to be the light from the new salmon pens where they're raising salmon. We'd, we'd met the future, Maine fishermen raising their own fish. We have two sites. Uh, one is Crag, which is down behind Harbor Island, and Toothaker Cove, which is up back of us there, about 10 minutes away. Uh, both, are, both are good sites. Well, the business came in, started about 1988. Uh, salmon farm here on the island, hatchery in Bingham. But by 1992, uh, they were unable to go forward, and the bank took them over. The bank kept it for a year, and then the bank was going to get out of it, so they, they were going to auction it off and get rid of it. So a small group of us went out and found some public monies and retained what salmon was left and, and, and 12 pence and started up. It means bringing fish in that are 18 months old from a hatchery in the spring, raising them for a year and a half and, half and hopefully getting them up to market size, preferably 9, 10 pounds. It's quite impressive when you see it. Some are contained in 50-foot diameter pens and nets. Some are in 80-foot nets and pens. Uh, the nets go down in the water about 25 feet and, and across. And it's uh, in the bigger nets, we raised 12, 14,000 fish. In the smaller, the 50-foot pens, about 6,000 fish. Well, we've now got a couple of hundred thousand salmon out there. And last year was our first crop, and we did we did process over over a million pounds of gutted fish. If someone hadn't have done it. If I hadn't have done it, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't have been here now. It would have been gone. I would have been fishing, I'd been making a good living, but like I said, every second week we, we give out, in the winter time, up to 50 checks. And they, 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 wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have been. Two men out fishing on a warm and foggy day. They do the things they've done for years in different ways. They get it while they can, it comes and goes, they say. And the gambling man might succeed and stay. I, I, I think the future is aquaculture. Every day we're increasing population-wise. That means we have to have more product to eat, and uh, the oceans just can't sustain it. I, I don't think it can sustain it, even with uh, quotas or regulations like they are, which, which are necessary. But, uh, Mankind needs food. Sonny Sprague is right. When I was growing up on the main coast, I remember a lot of fishermen like Sonny Sprague. And people would come, you know, from away, they still do, I think, and see Maine lobstermen and fishermen in their boats. And they think it's a wonderful, independent way to make a living. But times have definitely changed. Uh, it used to be that a boy graduating from high school with $5,000 could set himself up with a lobster boat and have his own business, but that's not true anymore. It costs more like 100000 today, and there are all kinds of regulations and rules and, and so on. But some Maine fishermen have still found a way to be independent. I've been fooling around with it for probably 
12 years, I've had one major failure, and that's probably what you learn the most from, is failing, you know, it's a real dramatic uh, uh, teacher. The wild mussel is, you know, all over the coast of Maine, and all we're doing in the cultivating process is taking the wild mussel larvae, giving, finding, giving it a place to set, we call that seed, and then we thin it out to an ideal density and put it on a rope so that it grows in a water column instead of just laying on the bottom. And by doing that, we shorten the amount of time it takes to grow to a market size mussel. And by shortening the amount of time, it's a younger animal when it's harvested, it's more tender, and because of the way it's grown, it has no opportunity to get pearls or any grit in it. It's hung in the water all the time. So it's a real nice, clean uh, product. The bigger percentage of the weight of the total animal is in the meat and not in the shell. The shell's really thin. You know, you can, you can break that shell pretty easily. So they're a little fragile, but as far as the person in a restaurant who's buying them, he gets a lot more meat per pound of total shellfish than you do in a wild animal. There's a sock hanging on every one of these lines about every about every three feet apart. Two feet apart, there's a, there's a sock that hangs down, and that's what the mussels grow in, are these socks that, that hang under the water. I just thought it'd be interesting to try. It's different. Um, it's very passive on the environment. You know, we don't add any feed. We don't add any Good. toxification. There's no uh, disease control. It's just a natural process. All we're doing is making it easier for the muscle to grow. So I think uh, anything that is a naturally occurring organism uh, in, the, in a marine environment is subject to stress from over harvesting and this is not to say that you know this one muscle farm is going to make a real big difference but the uh, the concept is right that we will we are taking care of our own source we're taking care of the the whole cultivating process i've been a fisherman myself uh, i've been a fisherman for more years than i've been an aquaculturist or a seafood dealer so i still have a a very strong feeling for the independence and and the free operation that most fishermen embrace. But the, the handwriting is not only on the wall, it's in our face, that being a fisherman isn't a very free operation anymore. This is much freer than being a fisherman. Oh, sure, because I, I have only my own imagination to figure out what to do with this 30 acres or, or however many it is that I'm working. I don't remember anyone eating mussels when I was growing up on the Maine coast in Hancock County. We, mussels were just there when we went down to the shore to go clamming or to have a lobster feed. I first had mussels at the French restaurant in town where they served them with mustard sauce and they were delicious. Of course today, mussels have become their own industry. We have smoked mussels, all kinds of mussels, a very popular delicacy. It took a lot of imagination to make Maine people enjoy eating mussels, but as Ted Ames found out, as you'll see in the next segment, it's going to take more than imagination for Maine's fishing industry to move into the future. And well, we used to go until Christmas. We used to gill net till Christmas around here, right up inside, but not now. <laughs> Twenty years ago, ground fish landings in Stonington would vary anywhere from three to seven million pounds a year. It's a lot into a, the economy of a town this size. And today, gee, I'd be surprised if you landed a million pounds in the course of a whole year, probably half that. It's a good day, real good day. Today, 20 years, years ago, no, you, this wouldn't be anything. Clean it. His father-in-law used to get. I was, he, I was referring to him. He'd fish 20 nets, 20 miles, and get 15,000. He's hauling 60 nets and going anywhere from 60 to 90 miles for this. 
and this is good today. When FIG grants became available, uh, we were able to get funds for two hatcheries. Recognizing that we needed to have a place to put them, uh, we were funded for making a survey of old spawning grounds for cod and haddock along Maine's coast. The blue areas here are uh, traditional fishing grounds that were reported by Rich and Good, and uh, both made fishermen-based surveys. They found these fishing areas are reported fishing areas all through here. Uh, my interview series with older fishermen, the fishermen reported that while they fished these grounds, they found ripe fish not on the majority of those grounds, but way up in here in the close to shore, literally the whole length of the coast. It's a huge area. In the eastern half of the state of Maine alone, they, uh, there are somewhere in the vicinity of 250 square miles of reported spawning area, most of which are within state waters. If we hadn't started now, we would never have found this information out. These were uh, fishing areas that, that uh, haven't had fish on them, many of them haven't had fish on them for 50 odd years. Most people on the list uh, were glad to share information, partly because there were no fish in, in those locations anymore, and they could see that uh, if it were actually possible to restore fisheries, that the people who are in the fishery today could enjoy the same, the same good fortune that they had had. If you set it up so that people who fish from these small communities can compete effectively for the resource, it would be a tremendous economic injury. We're all set whenever you are. You just go the length of the coast. If you had an extra two and a half million dollars per year dumped into the economy of each one of those towns, what it would mean in terms of jobs in, in rural Maine. I think collectively, we'd love to have our ground fish back, but we don't want the ground fish right in the middle of our lobster area. Many of us don't know whether that'll make that much difference on a lobster stock, but none of us want to take the chance. The management plan, to make this stuff sustainable, the management plan would have to be based on the area that that local stock uses. And it would have to include the people who actually fish for them. If you're from Portland and you come down and fish a local stock of Jericho Bay, that's based in Jericho Bay, you have to take part in the management plan so that when those fish back off the shore or are in a pre-spawning aggregation, somebody doesn't come in and just wipe out the entire population like we did before. That's a major change in management. It means that we need to, uh, that we need to have local management as a key part of the process. And it means that fishermen have to accept the responsibility for taking care of the resource. We're too good today. It used to be you'd go out and if you could find them, take all you could get. But today it's changed. We have the gear that allows us to take them all. So we have to control our efforts one way or the other. And it seems that once you've cleaned an area out, it's forgotten. Current fishermen just don't go there, and older fishermen just don't have anything to say about it, because it's done. It would really be exciting to be able to reverse that process. It would sure change our coastal economy. Throughout this series, we've met a lot of different people 
all over Maine who have one thing in common, their great love of this place called Maine. We all know that uh, change is inevitable, but Maine is a very, very special place, so we'd like the change to be gradual and sensible. I'm Sandy Fippen, and thank you for joining us on this edition of The Best of RFD Maine. Be sure to visit The Best of RFD Maine on Maine Public Television's home page on the World Wide Web. The Best of RFD Maine was taped on location at the Page Farm and Home Museum at the University of Maine. Production of RFD Maine is made possible through a television demonstration grant from Rural Development, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I find that for me to stay here, you've got to love the land. And uh, my wife calls the farm my mistress. So she, uh, she can be jealous at times, but it's first the love of the land, and then it's surviving with your wits and being an opportunist to dictate what you do to stay here.